We are reading Gladys Allward, The Adventure of a Lifetime by Janet and Jeff Bangi. We are on chapter 15, titled As Black as Night. For four days, Gladys and the children sat by the riverbank. They had waded in the shallow waters of the mile-wide Yellow River, but they had not crossed it. The old man at Huan Chu had been right. There was not a boat anywhere to ferry them across. On their first day at the river's edge, Gladys had sent the oldest boy back to Huan Chu to scavenge for food. The boys had found some stale cakes and a couple of pounds of half-rotten millet. Gladys had boiled it all in the kettle and ladled the soup out to the younger children. That was the last food any of them had eaten. As they waded by the river, Gladys could feel herself slipping in and out of consciousness. Her only clear thought was that she needed to get the children to stay in. Other than that, everything became blurry and unreal to her. The children were asking her questions. Why can't we walk on water like Jesus? And I would say, why can't you part the yellow river like Moses did? Gladys had no response other than to urge the tired, hungry children to sing hymns and pray. The hymn singing became the answer to their prayers. A nationalist Chinese soldier stood on the crest of the hill overlooking the peculiar sight of a large circle of dirty, thin children singing loudly. One of the younger children spotted him and raced up the hill, no doubt remembering the other Chinese soldiers who had shared candy with them two weeks before. Gladys looked up to see what all the excitement was about. Was that a soldier she saw? She couldn't be sure. Two of the children ran up and pulled her to her feet. She swayed slightly and peered, and soon the face of a soldier came into focus. I heard the singing, said the soldier. Who are you and what are you doing here? We are refugees on our way to Cyan, and we need to cross the river, said Gladys, too tired to think about where the soldier had come from or what he might be doing there. How many of you are there, he asked. Ninety-four, Gladys replied as she sat down again. Standing made her feel dizzy. Are you sick? asked the soldier when he saw she could not stand. Gladys shook her head. I'll be fine when I get the children to Cyan. Can you help us cross the river? The soldier looked slowly around at the children. Yes, he said quietly. I will help you, but it will be dangerous. The Japanese are not far away. If they fly over while we are in a boat, they will shoot us all. They have no mercy. He stopped and looked once again at the smallest children playing in the reeds. In fact, he went on, they have flown over this spot every day for weeks, shooting into the reeds. This week, for the first time, they have not come here at all. The soldier turned abruptly towards the river and let out a series of shrill whistles. Everyone watched eagerly as slowly an, old, an open wooden boat came into view. It took three trips to ferry Gladys and all the children across the river. Thankfully, no sign of any Japanese aircraft appeared overhead. On the other side, Gladys gathered the children to offer a prayer of thanks. The waters may not have parted like they did for Moses, but God still had provided a way across the Yellow River. Gladys and the children spent that night in a nearby village. As usual, when the villagers saw so many children, they did their best to help, willingly sharing their precious food supplies and their kangs. Finally, the next morning, Gladys and the children marched to the train station. Gladys had been told that since they were refugees, she and the children could board any southbound train free of charge, and the train would take them to Cyan. Along the way, refugee organizations had set up food stations. When Gladys heard this, she was too overcome with relief to speak. Instead, she put her hands over her face and sobbed. Could it be true? Was the worst really behind them? Gladys stood at the station, staring down the tracks, praying that a train would arrive. Then in the distance, she saw a puff of steam. A train was coming. Gladys had tried to tell the children about a train, but none of them had ever seen any moving machine before except for an airplane, and that had been a terrifying experience for them all. Excuse me. The railroad tracks began to vibrate as the train roared into view, hissing and belching clouds of white steam and dark smoke. When Gladys turned to reassure the children, they were gone, all 94 of them. In a split second, even the oldest children had panic and scattered in all directions. 
Some of the adults on the platform were laughing loudly, but it was no laughing matter to Gladys, who had 94 children to find before the train left. Thankfully, the engineer was not in too much of a hurry, and he waited patiently while Gladys trekked all the way back to the village gates to find some of the smallest children hiding there. Gladys convinced the children they were not entering the bowels of a giant dragon, and they all climbed aboard. True to what she had been told, the group was not charged to ride the train. As the train pulled out from the station, Gladys laid her head against the, pil the window and drifted off to sleep. Suddenly, she was awakened by screaming. In an instant, she was sitting bolt upright in pitch darkness. It took her a moment to realize where she was, and then she smiled. The train was going through a tunnel, and the darkness had scared the children. After three days, the children became quite used to life aboard the train. They didn't even blink at a tunnel, and they loved clambering off at some of the bigger cities to get a free meal. Gladys couldn't understand, though, why she didn't feel more refreshed as the days went on. She was getting food and rest, but it seemed to make no difference. On the fourth day, about mid-morning, the train hissed to a stop. Everyone peered out the windows. The train stood in a rocky ravine, and there was no station nearby. Gladys felt the chill run down her spine. Something bad had happened. She knew it, and she was right. The train had stopped for one simple reason. It could go no farther. The conductor made his way through the train with the bad news. The railway bridge ahead of them had been bombed. If they wanted to get to Cyan, they would have to climb over the mountain. The train was winding its way around and catch a train on the railway line on the other side. Gladys sat numbly at, as one of the other passengers asked how long it would take to reach the other side of the mountain. She shut her eyes when she heard the reply, four or five days. Weary, Gladys called the roll. Everyone was accounted for. Then she looked up at the steep rock face of the mountain. Could they do it? Would this nightmare journey never end? Gladys wondered whether maybe she'd done the wrong thing trying to lead the children to safety. In her attempt to save them, had she doomed them to a slow death? instead of a quick one at the hands of the Japanese. As her thoughts flowed, so did the tears. She sat on a nearby rock and wept loudly. The children began to cry too. At first, one or two of the youngest ones started and soon everyone was crying. They made quite a racket. After several minutes, Gladys wiped her eyes on the back of her sleeve. That's enough, she yelled over the noise. A good cry never harmed anyone, but now it's time to get going. Let's sing. And sing they did, up and down the mountains, along narrow tracks and through forests they sang. It took them five days to reach Tong Kwan on the other side of the mountain. At night they slept in caves and during the day they climbed or walked slowly, waiting for the lagging children to catch up. Gladys's constant assurance that they would find food and hot tea waiting for them on the other side of the mountain kept them moving forward. Uh, in Tong Kwan, Gladys received yet more bad news. There were railroad tracks, and there were trains running to Sion, but they were only cold trains. The tracks were closed to all other trains. The authorities had declared the route too dangerous for passengers because the tracks ran along the banks of the Yellow River where the Japanese were bombing. There was no exceptions to the rule. Gladys was stunned. She couldn't go on, and she knew it. For three weeks, she and the children had walked climbed and crawled their way over mountains, avoiding, avoided Japanese planes and begged food. The children were hungry, bleeding, and dehydrated. Their shoes were worn out, and many of them were coughing ominously. Gladys couldn't go forward, and she could not go back. She could only trust God. With that trust, she instructed the children to lay out their bedrolls on the station platform and get some sleep. Then she leaned against the wall of the station and drifted off to sleep. Gladys woke with two men shaking her. For a moment, she thought she was back in the train station platform at Cheetah Hall those years ago. Fear gripped her, but she was too tired to care. She just wanted to be alone to sleep. Let me alone. I want to sleep. This is a public platform, isn't it? She said grumpily. Within a few minutes, however, Gladys was wide awake and scrambling to her feet. She could har hardly believe the good news. Evidently, one of the coal stokers on the train had seen all the sleeping children sprawled out on the platform and had inquired about them. 
Then he'd convince the engineer to let the children ride the coal train right on top of the coal. Soon the younger children were being gently passed, still sleeping, from person to person and lifted onto the tops of the coal cars. One older child was assigned to each car and his or her job was to build a little coal wall around each sleeping child so the child wouldn't roll off the coal car when it lurched around curves. Once Gladys was satisfied that all the children were safely aboard, she too climbed in onto a pile of coal. When the little children awoke the next morning, they shrieked with delight. Everyone, even Iowa Day, was as black as the night. Coal dust had settled all over them. Gladys laughed too. It was so good to see the children happy again, and they were very well camouflaged. As long as the Japanese didn't bomb the train, they would make it to Cyan in three days. It was impossible to get comfortable sitting or lying on a pile of coal, but the children didn't complain too much. It was a lot better than hiking over mountains. The three days passed quickly, and finally the train hissed to a stop. The engineer walked back and told Gladys they were in Cyan. That was the good news. The bad news was that no one was allowed off the train there. The city had been overrun with refugees and no more people were allowed to enter the city. Guards stood on the train station platforms to make sure no one climbed off a train. Gladys didn't know what to do. The engineer told her the city of Fufeng was three days journey from Cyan and as far as he knew Fufeng was still accepting refugees. Gladys wept bitterly at the news, but deep inside she found the strength to go on. The next three days on the train were a muddled blur for Gladys. Sometimes she thought she was back in England with her parents. Sometimes she hid her head in her hands when she thought she heard Japanese planes. And sometimes she thought she was standing on the banks of a wide river she could never cross. By the time they got to Fufeng, Gladys couldn't celebrate. She hardly knew where or who she was. In spite of her condition, she managed to find an orphanage that would take all the children. Within two days of delivering the children safely to the orphanage, Gladys fell into a coma. No one could wake her from it, and she was transferred to a hospital.